our call is for me I okay okay sorry it's, it's for a holistic framework uh, that has a whole cycle from prevention mm. to um, um, uh, research treatment uh, disease management obviously a cure and that should be the you value uh, of the framework for um, better you health outcomes so we are confident that uh, uh, moving forward we will continue uh, working closely to the European institutions <laughs> to trying to fill in the gaps, the existing gaps, and implement a project and uh, policies raised from uh, these promising um, initiatives. Our interest group um, uh, will be fundamental in uh, uh, steering this work. So um, thank you, thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to the panel discussion afterwards. It's my pleasure to uh, give the floor to the European Academy of Allergy and uh, Clinical Immunology representative, the healthcare professionals uh, counterpart, and and our partners in in this interest group. No, thank Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Marcia. Thank you very much, Sirpa. Uh, I think that uh, there is not much more to be said after what Marcia said. I don't want to repeat the same idea. I'm here rep in representation of AACI, the European Academy of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, which is uh, like teaming up all the physicians working in the allergy field together with the basic scientists that, uh, that uh, we should not, uh, we should not either because they, they, they are providing devices uh, for us to improve in the future. I'm currently the chair of the asthma section of the, of the AKI, but I was uh, some years ago also the chair of the junior member, so I'm very happy to see here so many young people and uh, because it's very important for, uh, for the accomplishments of our goals in the future. So I think that this kind of initiative are, are crucial uh, to make uh, move the field forward and it's a very good example of uh, with what we can get together, uh, the stakeholders, also patients, patient associations, and uh, the scientists and health, uh, healthcare providers who have to team up to, to progress in this path. Also very nice that we can meet up finally in person after the pandemic. Um, apart from that, I, I want to stress what Marcia said that uh, in the, this uh, initiative of the European Union for non-communicable diseases, a great challenge and opportunity. It's true that it's uh, a step forward because uh, we didn't have something like that for decades. But on the other hand, even though asthma is there, uh, there is room for improvement, of course, uh, in relation to other allergic diseases that, that very often neglected. I'm thinking, of course, uh, of food allergy or different types of, food, of uh, uh, skin allergy, sorry, which often uh, occur in the same patients that have allergic asthma, who have allergic asthma. But also I'm thinking on other uh, conditions like drug hypersensitivity or venom allergy, which greatly, greatly impair the quality of life of patients and also themselves are risk factor for having other diseases or having worse outcomes, for instance. Antibiotic allergy is related to much, much worse outcomes when you have an infection or when you are admitted to the hospital. And those aspects need to be also addressed uh, by the European Union, and we need to work to, to raise awareness that, uh, of course, asthma or respiratory diseases are very important, but these other conditions are important themselves, not only when they occur in the same patients and who have asthma or, or other conditions, they are important themselves and need to, to, to have their, 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 their place. And we need to, to, to make everyone see that they need to have their place. So, and these kind of initiatives, I think that uh, are the, the way toward that direction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the three of you for setting the scene and more specifically to Ms. Spiatikainen to have taken under the wing this partnership between the healthcare professionals and the patients and started from the beginning this interest group on allergy and asthma that is hosting this event today. We cannot thank you enough for that, Mrs. Piatikainen. So I am Isabel Proagno, your improvised moderator today because we were awaiting and we are awaiting for the moderator that we will guide us through uh, the discussion today. 
hello also to those that are attending online. We will be grateful to see you later and to take your questions on board. Now, I think we have uh, Mrs. Marianne Taki already in uh, the uh, online setting. Mrs. Marianne Taki works at the European Commission. She's actually the team leader of the uh, coordination group with member states on NCDs, so the one that is talking about health promotion and prevention in Europe. And uh, um, I would really like to invite you, Mrs. Taki, to present on your perspective from the European Commission on the institutional um, aspects concerning chronic respiratory diseases with very clear questions and expectations that we've heard um, from Mrs. Pietikainen and also from uh, the patients and the doctors. So the floor is yours. I think we have some seconds. Yes, good afternoon. We were... Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I afternoon. Hope you hear me now. Yes. Good afternoon and greetings from Luxembourg. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today, even though I'm not physically with you there in Brussels. Uh, I would like to present to you the Healthier Together EU Non Communicable Diseases Initiative, focusing on chronic respiratory diseases. And uh, I was uh, very interested to hear what uh, Mrs. Pietikainen and uh, the representatives uh, from the research uh, community and from the patient representatives said, uh, I take note on your comments and challenges that we still have uh, to be addressed in the future actions uh, under the Healthier Together initiative. But uh, very, um, just a second. So somehow I cannot change the slides now. Just a second. Is there somebody from IT that can help me here? I think they are there looking into it. There we go. There we go. It's okay. Yes. So the NCD initiative, I'm very pleased to hear that uh, you also have recognized that it's a, it's a first initiative we actually do on chronic diseases for 10 years. Uh, as you know well, uh, member states are struggling, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic with um, NCDs. There were delays in terms of diagnostics or health promotion and disease prevention activities, screening for cancer, for example. And therefore we thought it's good time now to take stock on where are the member states' needs and how can we best support uh, member states and stakeholders uh, in uh, addressing these needs? The NCD initiative's uh, main objective has been to look at the key um, burden of disease areas in the EU. And that's why chronic respiratory diseases is one of those areas where we have uh, identified actions and, and discussion points and priorities with the member states. Um, health inequalities is a cross-cutting theme across all uh, strands that I uh, describe here. Uh, cardiovascular diseases and diabetes have been the first focus of 2022 uh, in terms of what kind of actions we can do with the member states and with stakeholders. You might be aware that uh, both cardiovascular diseases and diabetes will be addressed by the member states in a major collaborative action. It's called joint action. Uh, it's a 53 million euro action where um, the, the topics or the areas have been identified through the Healthier Together initiative. We also have a huge joint action coming up on health determinants. And this is also an area, I think, for your uh, stakeholders and your uh, interest groups where tobacco uh, cessation, prevention of smoking, uh, air pollutants, and et cetera, can be addressed. But again, it's really in the hands of member states in which areas they want to uh, focus on. The fourth area is on mental health and neurological disorders. Again, a very important area considering the, um, 
the problems we experienced, all of us, but especially the vulnerable groups during the pandemic. And now with the Ukraine war and the crisis for displaced people, we have millions of people who have uh, left their homes and their country, and we want to help them as well uh, during this very difficult time. The um, health determinants action uh, will be done in close collaboration with the cancer plan, Europe Beats Cancer Plan, because many of the risk factors, and I, I think everybody uh, online and also in the in the meeting room in Brussels know very well, uh, we cannot identify specific risk factors per disease. They are very much common and we want to address them holistically. Now, in terms of what is it that we want to do, uh, you might know that we prepared a paper, a guidance document, but this uh, initiative is not about paper. This is what we did not want to do. There's enough papers in the world and in Europe. What we want is to make sure that we discuss actions that can be implemented. These are called best practices in our, in our work area. Uh, for example, a best practice in your area could be the Finnish allergy and asthma program. And I saw Professor Tari Hahtela, my old uh, professor, uh, also uh, involved in this meeting. So there are a lot of good practices, best practices in Europe that could be more widely um, implemented and transferred if we would just be able to identify those. There are also guidelines or guidance, public health guidance, that could be uh, improved. Uh, there are uh, sets of guidance from the researchers, from the academics, but also from the health professionals, and we want to have a fresh look at those. And of course, um, policy reform here is not really related to uh, chronic respiratory diseases, but for example, in the area of mental health, uh, we are funding a program where uh, Belgian mental health reform is being uh, transmitted or uh, transferred to many other member states. So there are also actions in the member states, individual member states that can have benefits and we want to make sure that uh, other member states can benefit from those. Now, in terms of scope of action, um, the starting point is, of course, on promotion and prevention. Uh, you probably know that the eu for health uh, program, 5.4 billion euro program, has a, a special quote, 20% uh, of the budget should go on promotion and prevention. This is uh, sort of shared with the, with the cancer work, but again, our uh, focus and the reason why we wanted to have the Healthier Together initiative was to make sure that we are addressing the right things with the major budget that we have for the first time so that we can have impactful actions. Knowledge and data is a little bit more difficult area uh, in, in the area of NCDs. Uh, we have, of course, the data from Eurostat, but that's very high level and uh, related more on health systems than individual diseases. So we actually have a project now starting uh, with the colleagues from Joint Research Center, which is a service of the commission to support us in policy making, to look at how could we improve data and knowledge on diabetes. That's a pilot area uh, colleagues are looking at. Just to have an have a initial idea, if we could uh, find better ways of generating data and knowledge that can be used uh, for policy making. The idea is not to generate data for the fun of having data, um, but to really make sure that we have the tools for policymakers uh, also from the evidence basis. Now, on screening and early detection, uh, in the cancer area, which is probably the best known for everyone, uh, it's easier. But again, there are, for example, areas like lung cancer. What would be the best evidence base to do lung cancer screening um, for COPD, for smokers. Uh, there are a lot of areas where we could uh, have practices or approaches, and th those could be shared between the member states. Uh, and that's why we wanted to also include it here uh, for the chronic respiratory diseases. Now, of course, the diagnosis and uh, treatments, this is really in the health systems and in the hands of member states often. 
But again, here we could provide guidance of um, how, for example, self-management or self-diagnostics um, could be uh, developed. And that's why I wanted to include it on this uh, scope of action also for your area. And quality of life. Uh, you mentioned allergies, asthma. Quality of life is the key. Uh, it might not be that only premature mortality or morbidity is what we are looking at in, um, in burden of disease definition or the work we are doing, but quality of life is important across, uh, across diseases and areas. And I think especially for allergy patients, I, I suppose in the room, the people who are allergy patients, including myself, and asthmatic people, and we know how important it is to make sure that you have a good balance of your treatment so you can enjoy life um, to the fullest possible. The EU NCD initiative, it's, uh, it's our current toolkit for actions. Uh, I mentioned the best practices. Uh, we have a system of collecting best practices and then suggesting them to the member states and uh, transferring them with the funding from the EU for Health program. Best buys are from WHO, and uh, we have included them into our discussions with the member states and stakeholders. Even though some of the best buys are, of course, for like a, the lowest de denominator, uh, because it's also for uh, poorer countries in the uh, WHO Europe region. But at the EU level, uh, they are also best buy best buys or actions that could be implemented um, in the EU. Research results is an interesting area because we have had lots of projects at the EU level, but also in the member states on uh, respiratory diseases, allergy, asthma over the years. But surprisingly, well, maybe it's not surprising, but it's it's been very difficult to identify results of projects that could be implemented in the member states and sort of making the continuity of uh, if you have a innovative new approach or research, how that can be taken up in the health systems. And this is an area where we are trying to actually develop uh, a methodology. Uh, innovative ideas, uh, we call them in fact nowadays more on promising approaches or promising practices because there are lots of things that um, during the pandemic were tested, maybe piloted, but they are not fully evaluated or implemented. And we are trying to find those practices, promising ideas that could be taken forward uh, in the future. And for example, in the, in the 2022 uh, annual work plan, when we have an action for the member states on diabetes and cardiovascular diseases, we also have an action then for stakeholders exactly for that purpose that if there are new approaches developed by the stakeholders, we could find them and then test them uh, more broadly. The EU NCD initiative was also an opportunity to go through the commission um, tools. We looked at all policy and legislative tools and financial tools programs that are used for public health or health. Um, there's a guidance document on our website, and that has the second part of the document is really about mapping these different programs and uh, tools that could be used. Um, the, somebody mentioned that the EU NCD initiative was launched on uh, 22nd of June. That was exactly the day when we presented the the work that had been done over the six months before, but the work is not done, I'm afraid. I'm afraid we have to continue uh, together, all of us. So in the past six months before the June, we met with all EU member states. We had also a consultation with people, um, well, not uh, with different stakeholder organizations. It was an open consultation. And I think uh, also Isabel Proana, who is the, did you say you are the moderator ad hoc? Uh, I think your organization also contributed uh, to the webinars, but also to the uh, consultation in writing. And we're very pleased that this um, 
guidance document is the first time we have some sort of framework where we can actually start discussing the priorities with the member states and with the stakeholders. Um, as you can see from this list, um, there were lots of participants. It was a heavy process, but as a result, we have a starting point for, for continuing our work. We also, uh, of course, have close collaboration with WHO, Europe in particular, and with the OECD and European Investment Bank, all very important partners for us in, in taking work forward. OECD is uh, helping us with um, uh, implementation of best practices for the member states and WHO with their best buys, but also supporting member states in transfer of best practices is helping. And European Investment Bank have a lot of money which could be used uh, by the member states, but again, there are loans, um, but it is something where European Investment Bank is very interested um, to uh, help member states. We also screened uh, all the actions with the other directors generals, uh, general services of the commission and with the EU agencies. OSHA is, for example, an occupational health and they provided us input on chronic respiratory diseases. In this year's work plan, uh, you know that there is this diabetes cardiovascular disease joint action and the one on health determinants. The health determinants uh, joint action is 75 million euros. Two thirds of that um, budget is um, targeted on cancer and one third is on NCDs. Um, I invite you to, if you have contacts, I can also provide you the contacts with the member states as necessary uh, to liaise with your national counterparts in uh, finding if you can support member states in any of the actions on health determinants. I think there are very interesting things coming, uh, hopefully from the joint action. Uh, there will be also a call for stakeholders specifically on health determinants. So uh, keep an eye also on the Hadea website and our website, so uh, because we communicate on those as soon as uh, we can. Now, I guess this slide is not very useful for you because you're all experts more than I am. Uh, but in any case, chronic respiratory diseases is a major issue and challenge, public health challenge at the EU level. Um, the mortality rates um, are not very coherent in Europe. There are huge differences. Uh, Partly it's related to smoking. The countries where there is a higher prevalence of smoking or tobacco use, there are also higher prevalence, it's also a higher prevalence uh, of premature mortality from chronic respiratory diseases. But there are other uh, risk factors, of course, genetics, air pollutants, um, occupational health issues are very important also at the commission side. And we want to make sure that uh, the children are protected. Uh, so the secondhand uh, smoking, for example, and allergens are very important uh, in childhood prevention programs. Now I'm coming to the finally to the actions or the areas uh, where member states would like to, um, which they would like to prioritize. So there were three areas that the member states uh, came up with or in the discussions and with the consultation with the member, uh, with the stakeholders. So first of all, it's the prevention uh, of um, chronic respiratory diseases, preventing uh, the start, I mean, preventing of having them and then delaying their start or uh, focusing on the progress of uh, chronic respiratory diseases. Uh, smoking, again, very important, uh, and then chemicals and pollutants. But of course, also the uh, vaccination. I don't think anybody mentioned here vaccination, but uh, in fact, childhood immunization programs, as well as now COVID-19 vaccinations, and for example, tuberculosis, are very important to keep in mind, uh, considering that uh, we have already tools that can uh, prevent chronic respiratory diseases. And those should be used, of course. And uh, children, again, very important uh, target group 
uh, in the area of uh, chronic respiratory diseases. Um, and for example, the allergies here uh, were mentioned. I think uh, children's allergies need to be extremely well um, uh, screened, found, and then uh, treated because there's a, such a long-term uh, impact uh, for children. Um, well, then, how to detect respirat chronic respiratory diseases? Uh, this is uh, something a little bit more underdone uh, area at the EU level. Uh, of course, pyrometric could be something um, that could be used more widely in primary care. If there's, for example, opportunistic screening, a smoker comes to your um, GP's office and you look at the different risk factors, and then you did the spirometry. Um, early diagnosis uh, would allow uh, delaying of the onset of COPD, and uh, for example, smoking uh, could be tackled more effectively, uh, the, making sure that smokers could stop. Um, one of the most effective ways would be uh, showing them the spirometry uh, results and working together with them to stop smoking. Now, in terms of the self-care and uh, care in general, uh, like I mentioned, this is really in the um, competence of the member states, but again, raising awareness and educating health professionals, patients and communities. I think the patient groups are in the core uh, for this area of work because you know the ground level work and you have the best contacts and that's why we also want to have these calls under the uh, EU for Health program to make sure that uh, you can use your contacts and make sure that uh, um, the different patient groups uh, locally and nationally can uh, work with uh, uh, patients. The therapies and uh, improving availability and affordability and access is of course important, but here we are not looking at specific uh, treatments or drugs or so on. But of course, within the overall pharmaceutical strategy of the EU, uh, this hopefully will improve the situation also for chronic respiratory diseases. And again, uh, as a self-management, it's a key area where we hope that member states will want to uh, focus on uh, rehabilitation and education. Um, Thank you very much, Mrs. Taki. This is it. Um, um, can we speed up uh, what is remaining from your presentation, please? Thank you. Yes, I, I, I understand. I jumped into this is so exciting topic for me. It's very rare I can speak about medical things uh, in the commission. But okay, so for the next steps, uh, we are now collecting from the member states best practices. Uh, we had a marketplace with uh, with the member states. And, uh, for example, the Finnish allergy and asthma program was presented there. Member states will decide on those in October. And then uh, in the future, we will fund uh, projects, all including on chronic respiratory diseases. And we will not stop meeting with the stakeholders. We plan to organize a webinar early next year with all the stakeholders to re revisit uh, the priorities and actions necessary also in this field. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Taki. Thank you also for your passion because um, this is uh, very central to the patient's life, the quality of life every day. So also to know that there is people sitting at the commission looking at this carefully is very encouraging for us. We have technically a technical break to set up the table again, and that will be the end of my improvised moderation today. So I welcome uh, the team to help uh, setting up um, the, the table. Uh, I think you can stay, uh, Mrs. Pietikain, if you would like to. Okay. And um, in the meantime, I keep on so to inform everybody in the room and online that um, you can follow Ifa and Iaki both on Twitter. We are telling what's going on in this event, important event today, where we have three members of the European Parliament in the room interested on allergy and asthma. So thank you very much. You will uh, be joining us later. And um, what I would like to also say is that 
Um, the most of the participants today in the room are here visiting Brussels for some of them for the first time as part of the Youth Parliament for Allergy and Asthma that is run by IFA, the organization I'm representing, European Federation of Allergies and Airways Diseases. And it's fantastic to see their engagement today in these topics that are certainly important for them, but also very technical. So now let's give the floor to them and I pass it on to Jennifer. Well, thank you very much indeed. Apologies, I wasn't here to greet you earlier, but I am glad to make it for the panel discussion. And of course, I've seen the notes from our fantastic keynote speakers who were introducing the session today. So they've really set up this whole forum for a great discussion. And obviously, we're going to try and get to the meat of that in our discussions. As was mentioned, the second part of today is going to be in two parts. Now, the first part is taking the view of the youth, as we see so many of you here in the room. Thank you very much. And I'm sure many more are joining us online as well from around Europe and who knows, maybe even further afield. So we're delighted that you're taking the interest. I think it shows a lot of commitment and a lot of spirit and indeed courage sometimes to come up and talk about these issues and really tell policymakers what it is you want to hear and see from them. So we're going to hear about the youth needs, priorities and expectations from an EU approach on allergy and asthma that will integrate the youth perspective. And of course, this year, 2022, is indeed the year of youth for the European Parliament, something that the European Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen, clearly last year as one of her, her aims to bring more young people into the discussion. So with that, I will, I will start by introducing you to our first youth speakers. Thank you very much. Indeed, we have joining us uh, obviously members of the Allergy and Asthma Youth Parliament and also in her case, a graduate medical student studying at Queen's University in Belfast, Emer O'Vork. Emer, if you pull the microphone towards you and hit the red button, we would love to hear your thoughts. Dear members of the European Parliament, colleagues of the Youth Parliament, distinguished guests, my name is Emer Work, and I am a member of the European Allergy and Asthma Youth Parliament. But first and foremost, I'm a patient living with allergies. I'm 25 years old, and in those 25 years, I've had six near-death experiences. And more importantly, all were due to human error and completely avoidable. You see, I have a nut allergy. If I ingest a juice of peanuts, my body goes into anaphylactic shock, my throat closes, I could lose consciousness and die. But I'm not alone. More than 150 million Europeans have an allergy. And there's no survival guide on how to live with allergies. Much of our own learning about our condition is through trial and error and adapting our lives to protect ourselves. For me, eating out is one of the biggest challenges. Dining out with friends and family is such an essential part of our social fabric. The finding a way to do so is really challenging and time consuming for individuals with allergies and intolerances. Quickly coming to the realization that I just couldn't walk into anywhere for food like my friends, I compiled a list of allergy friendly places as a guide for myself and my younger brother who also has a nut allergy because I knew he was gonna face the same challenges. So after meeting others in similar allergy journeys who've shared their experiences through conversations I developed a single platform to unite our dining experiences called Allergy Act. It helps individuals find reliable food options aligned with their dietary requirements, based on reviewed experiences from others, giving them the opportunity to explore a wider range of recommended dining experiences. Now, this was my attempt to help protect myself, my brother, and others with allergies within the allergy community, because at that time, there were no other supports available. Having spent many hours in doctor's offices and hospitals growing up, I was also struck by the service gaps, the lack of awareness and misconceptions in not just the food industry, but also the health system. My final year dissertation focused on individuals with food hypersensitivities, and it first sparked my interest in the research field and highlighted the pivotal role that research could play in changing this narrative. So fueled by my interest in this area, 
I worked on allergy research projects in Ireland, in the UK and in the US. And some of our main findings over the years are, if you have a food hypersensitivity, it's going to cost you. Socially, we found that it's led to a lower health status and quality of life. And in fact, fatal anaphylaxis is more common amongst teens and young adults than any other age groups. But one of the leading ways to help solve these problems and help improve the health, safety and quality of life of those affected is to help drive research to be completed in collaboration with patients, the health sector, the food industry and the public. So this can improve both the quality and relevance of research. It can generate robust data, which can then be used as the evidence base to help inform policies, guidance and future supports. So in line with this work, I'm also actively involved in allergy charities and support groups and found that although parents attended and benefited from these groups, young people were less likely to, to, to attend and therefore their needs were unmet. So being surrounded by parents' conversations about allergy-friendly preschools and what to do when baby Timmy breaks out in a rash because now he's allergic to nappies, I found that I set out to find something a bit more relevant to my experiences. So I then found the European Allergy and Asthma Youth Parliament, and I knew this was where I had to be. So not just for myself, but for the allergy community, because this was where we could meet change, and this was where we would be listened to. So ultimately, I knew that the Youth Parliament aims at bringing the voice of young patients, the patients that face different problems than adult patients, with distinct needs, priorities and capabilities for the disease, to the forefront of policymaking. So this is why the EU Non-Communicable Diseases Initiative is one of the biggest opportunities for the voice of all patients living with allergy and asthma, especially for patients like me, and my colleagues of the Youth Parliament present here today. To be heard, to be taken into account, and to have a youth in all policies, integrated approach in the EU policies to come. To integrate the voice of young people, we recommend making use of digital and social media tools to allow for fresh, real feedback from young patients on their realities. To support awareness raising, raising initiatives at a local level in schools and universities and consult with young patients directly when drafting policies affecting us, such as the NCD initiative, as allergy and asthma are diseases more prevalent for the youth. So I thank you for your attention today and I look forward to the discussion of the panellists on the integration of the voice of the patients and particularly young ones living with allergy and asthma in the policy actions of the EU NCD initiative. And now pass the floor to my colleague of the Youth Parliament, Dunya Rich. Thank you very much. Dear members, present here, dear guests, I apologize, present here and online. My name is Dunya Stejanovic, and I have been a member of European Allergy and Asthma Youth Parliament since it was established in 2020. Um, as it was already mentioned, allergy and asthma are two of the most common uh, chronic diseases that are present. And something that is not underlined enough is the amount of youth patients that are among them. Uh, currently in Europe, there are over 10 million people living with asthma. They're under 45. And combining asthma with atopic dermatitis and allergies in general, there are over 13.5 million people under 25 including myself, I'm 24. Something brief about my, uh, my story with allergies is that uh, I've had my first um, injection of antihistamines when I was like five or six. And later, uh, not until high school actually, I was officially diagnosed with asthma. But I spent uh, previous, uh, previous several years um, wiping my nose every day, red eyes, dry eyes, coughing, wheezing, lack of sleep, I was the number one in my class for having tissues, but then it turned out to be asthma. And in, uh, in the beginning of, of college, I was officially diagnosed with atopic dermatitis. And I didn't know what that was. I didn't know I had the predisposition to have it. And it turned out that I'm the 
kind of book example of having, having an atopical constitution. I have atopic dermatitis, allergic rhinitis, and um, allergic asthma. And some short story that I want to say about a little personal is that uh, having the exacerbation of atopic dermatitis, I remember walking into, walking into a shower, my uh, entire skin was covered with wounds, and uh, every dot of that water was uh, quite painful. So I remember telling myself that I will not take any other shower when my skin gets better, any other shower for granted again. And I remember that almost every time, every day. So uh, something that has helped me a lot beside my family, of course, is uh, are those national associations that are present and National Association of Serbia has also led me to this uh, European Youth Parliament. And I'm truly privileged for having the opportunity to speak in behalf of Youth Parliament and to speak in front of you. And um, I also want to acknowledge the vulnerability that adolescents have and uh, how vulnerable they are, uh, adolescents and young adults. And they are an extremely important group that we should be dedicated to. And I think we cannot make a change only if we if we all work together. So I want to thank you all for your attention and I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing the discussion between the stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dunya. And of course, you're yourself are a pharmacy student and a member of the Allergy and Mean National Patient Organization in Serbia. So I think you've raised some interesting points, including diagnosis, which is one I'm sure we'll mention. Uh, with that, we'll go on to the second part of our discussion. Uh, we have, of course, uh, on the panel here, many distinguished speakers as well as those joining us online. So let me start by introducing MEP Yunash Olegas, who is the member of the EP Institute on Asthma and Allergy. Uh, Marianne Taki, we heard from already, is still online, still joining us. Michaela Odmir is president of the Swedish Asthma and Allergy Association. We also have joining us Ebon Egu Elusiat Grazia, who is joining us. Uh, he's the asthma section chair in the allergy unit at the Hospital Regional Universitario de Malaga. I'm also pleased to welcome also online Arzo Jorgan Cholgu, who is the chair of the ERS Advocacy Council. Thank you very much indeed for joining us online. Next to me, uh, we have also joining online Tari Hatela, who is the professor at the Hospital District of Helsinki and Usima. And next to me, Thomas Yarti, who is a paediatric allergist at Turku Hospital hospital in Turku University Hospital in Turku. So thank you all very much. Let me start, uh, Jonas, with you. Um, as a member of the political group that's championing this EU health union, what do you think the NCD Healthier Together initiative can really achieve in concrete terms of better health? In particular, obviously, we're talking about allergy and asthma health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. I, uh... I am from the SND group, the, the social democrat group, the political group that was the, the first to propose the move to the real European health union. Because you know that uh, uh, health uh, mostly related with uh, our responsibility for member states, not so much for Europe. Our, our goal was to accelerate recovery from the pandemic, but also to pave the way to a uh, stronger Europe that protects the health of the citizens. Since then, there have been uh, several uh, steps toward uh, this direction. But I think that the uh, EU uh, uh, non-communicable disease initiative is a turning point in the sense that it targets diseases uh, which high on what needs such as chronic respiratory diseases. So what we can expect from this initiative, from my point of view, even through the maps, have not been part of the shaping the initiative, and I agree with the, my colleague, uh, Mrs. Peitikainen, that EU should have had a, a role in this uh, situation. I think that the initiative can uh, really contribute to, to better uh, health outcomes in chronic respiratory uh, patients. Specifically for allergy, for example, I think that there is um, some of room to recalibrate the initiative with more targeted policies and actions. As a healthcare professional myself, I'm a medical doctor and surgeon, I can assure you the, of the huge burner borne by patients due to the difficulties living with the diseases. Allergy may 
uh, come at any point in, in life with the diseases. Allergy may come and uh, also uh, closely linked with the other diseases such as asthma. The, so prevention and care aspects uh, must be strengthened and even put in a concrete framework uh, of actions. Moreover, research for allergy treatments must be supported and advanced. This can happen uh, throughout specific programs that seeks to provide a better understanding of the diseases and use this basis to develop initiative uh, therapies, innovative therapies. Obviously, we should always keep in mind that uh, innovative treatments and methods must remain accessible and affordable to the patients. Secondly, the implementation of prevention and care policies must be supported, working closely with the member states to build awareness and ownership. For example, climate-related hazards such as uh, heat waves, wildfires emission, and floods are very uh, widely acknowledged today as a crucial health determination, specifically harmful for the respiratory health and cannot be absent from the initiative. At the same time, supporting countries in deliver, delivering better healthcare is key for, for the patients. This includes the use of digital technologies that can be of great help for allergy and asthma patients, but also taking inspiration for the best practice and national programs in the area of respiratory health. So the crucial issue is how to can we take the maximum potential of the non communicable disease initiative. And for this, we will need a wider of the scope of include allergy as mm -hmm. well as support of implementation on the ground. And finally, we must ensure that there's enough space for young people uh, like those today in this room to participate in the discussions and co shape the decision. It is a matter of inclusively, but also of, for the, of the better policy looking into the future. After all, evidence shows that it is young age that are mostly affected by allergy and asthma, and we must work to reverse this trend. From our side, the, our group, as and group, will stand by any initiative that protects health and ensures access to the qualified healthcare for all. We hope that to work closely in the future, Mr. Stacker, both with the Commission and the Member States. Well, thank you. I think uh, that's all certainly something that we'll all think is very clear and, and a common view of everyone. Marianne, I, I know we've already heard from you, but if we could just give us a briefly a, a taste of what you uh, think we've got to come still. Well, in terms of the actions, um, so basically the member states have now discussed in the Healthier Together initiative what they would like to do. And the funding program is the EU for Health, and we are now pretty much shaping um, the actions that could be taken forward uh, under the 2023 annual work plan. I'm afraid I cannot reveal what will be in this uh, annual work plan, but I invite you to follow the Hadea website and Santa website. Uh, in principle, we will follow the same model as we have this year. We will have a joint action among the member states and then a call for proposals for stakeholders. So the same model we will continue to follow for the other strands that are not uh, yet addressed. I hope this answers to your question. Thank you, Marianne. I just wanted to make sure to bring you in at this point. Um, I'm going to turn, uh, Michaela, to you now, because you're a former president of the EFA, and I know that brings with it a perspective of both national and EU level. So what do you think about what the uh, NCD initiative could achieve and what sort of policies could it trigger? Michaela, if you grab that one, So, thank you, Jennifer. Well, I fully agree with the Marsha's comment earlier, and this initiative presents both opportunity and challenge for the patient community. Apart from the roles that you mentioned, I have asthma and I have 
I'm also a mother of three children with severe allergies and asthma. And like Emer said, I have a son with severe allergies who I nearly lost some years ago. And just this year, he had had two anaphylaxis shocks. So in asthma, prevention, diagnosis, and disease management are the aspects that need to improve in Europe. For example, asthma underdiagnosis is a huge challenge and may affect up to 70% of asthma cases. The evidence from already, uh, from already diagnosed patients is also alarming. According to a survey that IFA did, one in four patients had to go to the emergency room within the last 12 months. Not being able to breathe is terrifying, fighting for air, quality of life issue that should be improved through digital solutions and tools. So now we are looking at allergy. It has been historically neglected from EU and national policies, suffering from underinvestment, attracting limited research interest, and often trivialized as a soft disease. It's just allergy. In fact, allergy, allergy can be hugely deliberating disease, offering all aspects of life. Today, there are over 150 million patients with allergic diseases in Europe, while medical sources make the shilling prediction that even 50% of people in Europe will suffer from some type of allergy in 2025. That's soon. Therefore, we need the EU-level initiative specifically targeting allergy, because allergies are a whole atopic universe of rhinitis, food allergy, dermatitis, and other that require holistic framework. Drawing from successful national examples, like the one we will hear about from Filmland, can be very helpful. And Sweden actually announced one month ago that they will invest in these diseases. So we should not leave allergy to become a disease with highly unmet needs, just because of the lack of attention. On the other hand, patients must be at the core of the discussion, be it for policy, uh, policies, development of medicine and therapies. This is also true for young people who sometimes have distinct needs, expectations and capacities than older patients. It's wonderful to see you here. Again, both allergy and asthma are complex diseases, which make patients' involvement even much more crucial. So my message are clear. The NCD initiative must have a clear mission to improve the life of allergy and asthma patients. How? Well, encouraging structural change at national level that embraces allergy and asthma health like the one in Finland investing in access and promote per, uh, personalized approaches to make sure that treatments are fit for purpose for every individual patient. Involving patients at all levels, discussion and decision, like Marianne earlier said. For its part, both IFA at uh, and at national level, we are ready to continue working together closely with the Commission to improve the NCD initiative. Well, thank you, Michaela, for, for being so clear and concise. Um, Yvonne, let me turn to you. Um, you know, as a, as a scientific community member, tell us what you want to see from this initiative, particularly in the area of prevention and diagnosis care. Well, I think that uh, there are several reasons why uh, we don't find, we don't see allergy in the place it, in, the, in, the, in this uh, later initiative we were discussing. I think that we have to be aware that uh, for for most of, uh, in most uh, European countries, or that the, the most common situation that the, is that allergy is largely lacking in the training curricula of medical students. That is a big problem. So it's very hard for medical students to identify allergy as a true career choice. And uh, after graduation, uh, allergy is not recognized as a specialty in all European countries is in many, but not in all of them. So uh, I think that this is, is very hard for a, a person who is studying medicine to, to identify that like the field 
uh, to allocate their life when you are not properly trained. So, and how is this related to what we are seeing in the in the in the project of the non-communicable diseases? It's, it's very hard that uh, the, the 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 disease is going to be there if there is not a strong uh, pressure from uh, you know the medical community, uh, properly organized. Uh, a community also linking with the patients association so i think that that is uh, in one way that is uh, a good explanation for what is happening here for instance in the european academy of allergy we are trying to 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 make allergy as a career choice we organize a project which is called the the allergy college uh, for uh, for medical students where you know, they can come to our meetings and they can see that allergy is actually a career choice. And I think that if we have a strong community of physicians and patients association in every a member state, that will help that uh, when these kind of projects are being developed, are being written, uh, then, then the pressure from that community will be there and then allergy will find its place. So everything is related, even though it might look a bit uh, unconnected, everything is related. That is one thing. And on the other hand, I think that uh, we have to, to make the stakeholders understand that uh, 21st century medicine is not only about uh, preventing mortality, it's also mostly about improving quality of life, to, to, to make better the lives uh, of patients while the patients are alive. So I think it's, this, is, this is very important. And we, ha we cannot reinforce uh, enough the fact that most of these diseases, deadly diseases that were presented before, diabetes or, or, or hypertension, they impair quality of life on average, on average, much less than allergic diseases. Allergic diseases, I'm talking, for example, allergic rhinitis. I'm sure everyone here will think that allergic rhinitis is a trivial disease. Well, I don't know the definition of trivial, but I can tell you that the life of a person with severe allergic rhinitis is more impaired than most patients with diabetes, for example. And this is a fact and it's proven. And if we are not only talking about quality of life, we also talk about cost. The loss of productivity related to allergic rhinitis is much higher than the loss of productivity related to arterial hypertension, for example. And then everyone recognizes hypertension as an important thing, uh, but uh, even patients uh, understand that they need to take medications even they don't have symptoms because this can lead them to death, but it's much hard uh, to, to get the same with. with the, uh, and another example, for example, is, uh, as I said before, antibiotic allergy. So people with antibiotic allergy, it's demonstrated that they have like, uh, they, they, they die more when they are admitted to the hospitals because they don't can take the antibiotics they need and that Actually, this is related to higher cost during the hospital admissions because they need to use more expensive medications and also to uh, antibiotic resistance that I think everyone recognizes as a very important health problem. So all these facts are here. We need a strong medical community to make them uh, visible for everyone, including stakeholders. Thank you. I think you've hit on some key points there. And of course, skills shortages or expertise shortages vary from country to country. So yeah. fortunately, we are going to hear about a best practice in, in just a few moments. And indeed, it is about wellness. It's health care, not illness care that we're talking about. Aozu, um, let me talk to you, please bring you online. And perhaps you could talk particularly about the needs of patients living with asthma. Uh, what needs to happen now immediately, urgently? What would you call for? Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting European Respiratory Society to take part in this very important meeting. We very much support EU NCD initiative and think that it's a great opportunity for respiratory community. Sorry for not being there in person. Um, first of all, making a correct diagnosis is essential for asthma treatment. We need to improve access to good quality spirometry, which will help to reduce misdiagnosis. And our expectation for asthma is, of course, not cure, but a near normal or preferably normal life with controlled disease by the proper use of effective medications of patients. That is a very important message we need to pass to our patients. Uh, as we have heard before, as a diabetic or a hypertensive patient takes his medication on a regular basis, regardless of his symptoms, 
and this is very much uh, should be the same for our asthma patients. And also, we need to improve their expectations. We need to raise the bar and do not let them adjust their lives according to their diseases. An asthmatic person can live a normal life. This could be the message. And we know that the inhaled corticosteroids are the cornerstone of our management. Uh, and when they are used appropriately, uh, the patient could be under control so uh, and have a normal wind. So we don't want our patients to be uh, on uh, short-acting agonists, beta agonists, because uh, they have a high risk of morbidity and mortality. This could be another important message uh, that should be delivered by the physicians to our patients. Uh, and it's a fact that uh, ICS therapy, uh, the adherence to ICS therapy is extremely poor. And also as physicians, we need to tackle with this. And also another aspect, Unfortunately, many people with asthma globally do not have access to effective quality assured asthma medicines. Even though ICAs, inhaled bronchodilators, budesonide and formiterol combinations are on the essential drug list of WHO, they are regrettably unavailable or unaffordable in many settings. And also, we need to promote this at national levels at uh, member states. And also another reason and lack of availability of the medication is not the only reason with asthma uh, who do not receive effective care. And there are misconceptions uh, about the nature of the disease and its treatment. Uh, and there is a great stigmatization and corticophobia. So it's important to elicit, uh, elicit patients' beliefs and concerns in order to understand the reasons behind their medicine uh, medication taking behavior. And I will conclude saying that education, education, education at all levels. Uh, with a chronic lifelong disease such as asthma, it is so important for patients to be provided with education and skills in order to effectively manage their asthma. This is the most effectively achieved through the partnership between the patient and their healthcare providers. So uh, we also must take into account the different cultures and social cultural factors. Uh, we need effective dissemination and implementation strategies, and not only physicians, but all the respiratory societies, patient societies, and our youth power, as we have seen today, is necessary. Thank you very much. Thank you, and we will try and bring some of those technical aspects, but we're trying to focus on what we need here now from the EU side. So um, I think uh, we're going to, uh, Thomas, hear from you. Um, the, you're from the Finnish Allergy and Asthma Programmes. Now, the, the Finnish experience has been highlighted by the European Commission as a best practice. Tell us uh, what has been your experience. Well, thank you for the in invitation. Um, my background is I'm a professor of pediatrics, pediatrician and pediatric allergist. And um, I'm not in the steering committee of this program, but I could take a kind of a point of view of practicing uh, allergist. I see about 3,000 to 4,000 patients per year. So, so what is the uh, Finnish allergy program? It's basically a huge educational effort. There's, there's a small, there was a small steering committee consisting of 12 people and they organized these events, nearly 400 events throughout the country in this 10 year time span. Two hour events, half day events, in the working hours that a full uh, allergy clinic would take part and discuss these new, new aspects. And overall about 24,000 uh, professionals participated and there were also a campaign for the lay public uh, uh, affecting 2.3 million people nationwide. So my point of view, uh, the allergy program really came at the right time, mm -hmm. right way, and it really gave the right message. And, 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 and now that we are living in this dig dig digital time, I have to say that it was all face to face throughout the country. So it was a huge effort. People were there, they were discussing things. And that kind of initiated this group activity and made the change, both in uh, professionals and in, in uh, patients. So, uh, but what were the aims? 
We previously had this asthma program in the 90s. It was all about the disease, asthma, early treatment, uh, controlled treatment, uh, networking. But here in the allergy program, uh, we achieved the balance in prevention, endorsing health, strengthening the immune system, and, and, uh, and avoiding uh, unnecessary treatment, cutting costs. We also reviewed uh, all aspects, you know, disease burden, uh, emergency needs, occupational health, uh, uh, certified laboratories, but really the balance was in the prevention. And this prevention mechanism, uh, they are important because we are talking about NCDs, which, is, which are all kind of uh, inflammatory conditions. They share the same mechanisms. They share uh, many of the same risk factors in, in, in our environment and also the pro protective factors. We are connected in our environment and really, really we need to endorse health and what we learn about allergies, this kind of indicator for other NCDs because it's so common, it is easy to investigate. So it's all about promoting uh, tolerance to allergens and, uh, and uh, basically we didn't want to uh, uh, take care of, of uh, small problems. We kind of went over the top in over diagnostics, over treatment, taking care of, of two small legal problems. And uh, part of it makes the U-turn. Uh, other aims were in the occupational health, regarding severe allergies, and, uh, and uh, uh, getting higher standards, like uh, more certified laboratories. So what were the results? Uh, uh, we couldn't get down the prevalence of allergic diseases, but their increase leveled. Talking about asthma, uh, allergic rhinitis, uh, atopic dermatitis, while many other NCDs were in, still in rise, and in other countries, allergic, allergic diseases were in rise. Uh, in children, emergency visits for asthma decreased by 40%. Uh, including all the hospitalizations in adults, about 5%, uh, which was remarkable. Milk allergies decreased by 50%, elimination diets decreased by 50%, uh, occupational uh, asthma and allergies decreased by 40%, only by this heavy educational effort. Mm -hmm. And uh, cost wise, uh, uh, there are gradual savings. If you compare to the year before, the year 2007, the annual savings, savings increased year by year, and the last year, uh, 2018, it was 200 million per year savings. So uh, total savings in this 10-year program were like 1.2 billion compared to 2007. And the organization was very flat, about 20 persons, uh, limited funding, basically, and uh, and uh, they were able to get this uh, huge nationwide change in attitude, in both in professionals and and uh, 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 patients and their parents. I'm going to I'm going to stop you there because I'm going to bring in your colleague Tari because okay. I, I see you, you I think it's important to make the business case okay. if you like for this and but of course it's about saving lives as as well as saving euros. Um, Tari, uh, you are also uh, the chair of the Finnish Al Allergy and Asthma Programmes. You've also had experience on this best practice. What would you like to see happen at an EU level? Because we've got this uh, initiative now, but there are some gaps that we're seeing. What do you call for, for those gaps to be closed and more to be done on allergy and asthma? Well, do, Tari? Can, you hear, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Go ahead. Okay. Hello, everyone. And thanks for Thomas, uh, you took up the, the important and essential points there. But I, my, my first message is that stop developing anything. Do not develop anything. Tell what you are going to do. What are your goals? And preferably they should be numerical. Then tell what are the tasks? How are you reaching the goals? What are the tasks? What tools are you going to use? So what 
by what means you are reaching the goals and how you are going to follow the outcomes. So that would be the right way to go. We speak too much and do too little. Uh, then another issue, which is very important, is that uh, the increase, this, the so-called allergy and asthma epidemic is not caused by uh, changes in basic genetics. It's caused by our urban lifestyle and changes in environment. And we can have an effect on our lifestyle and uh, to the environment. And it's a very, very essential issue that by improving the life of allergic patients and preventing allergies, like Thomas said, they are also showing a model how to prevent other non-communicable diseases, which all share the same uh, background factors. And uh, the, where you see the so-called low-grade inflammation, whether we are speaking about uh, diabetes or obesity or depression, even Alzheimer and cancer. And then thirdly, uh, by, by taking this priority in the society, because we know during the uh, corona pandemic, we all uh, saw what is the uh, priority number one in most societies, it is health. So if we use this uh, uh, health priority and we can open up to the public and, and the decision makers that, that by preventing the non-communicable diseases, by preventing the pandemics, we can also tackle the, the, the big global environmental challenges, nature loss and climate change. Uh, because this uh, allergy and asthma is pretty much caused by the disconnection of man from uh, uh, the evolutionary home, from soil, from natural waters uh, and natural air. And the protective factors, what we are losing in the urban settings, they are mostly microbes, but they are also biogenic chemicals. So this is this is really, really a big issue. And then, of course, as a, as a clinician, as a doctor, uh, we saw in the Finnish program that uh, it is relatively easy to improve the management and treatment and also uh, guide the patients for self-management. Uh, uh, the, the results, they were, they were amazing. They were amazing. And if you think about, uh, it was not that the Finnish program was not uh, uh, implemented so that it's some kind of a cost saving program. Cost, we did not think about the cost savings at all. We wanted to improve the patient's uh, uh, diseases, whether whether we are speaking about asthma, rhinitis, dermatitis, or, or, or what, whatever. But as a consequence of this improved health in the uh, allergic population in Finland, the cost savings, like Thomas said, was 1.2 billion euros. Scale that up to the European level. Scale that up to other non-communicable diseases. This is a really big issue, and, and the allergy community can pave and show the way. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed. Now, I know we are running short of time, but if there are any questions in our room to our panellists, or, or if any of our youth members would like to make a comment and say what they would like to see, now is the time. If you want to raise your hands, if we've got any questions, and of course, whether any of our esteemed MEP colleagues would like to ask a question, you're very welcome to do so now. I don't think we have any online. And anyone, any of our youth colleagues? I think everyone is too shy and too listening to, to what's being said up here. But we do appreciate you all being here because we are trying to listen to you and, and take on board what you would like to say. Um, I'm going to take a quick moment um, and ask our, our youth representatives on the panel, would you like to make a point um, or, or ask of anything? You've got the ear of the European Parliament here, Ema. Would you like to make any questions? Just press the button here. Yeah, we'll just kind of... Outlining what, what I had said earlier, that what we would like for, to integrate the voice of the young people, we would recommend making use of digital and social 
experience to allow for fresh and real feedback from young patients on the studies and to support the awareness raising initiatives at a local level in schools and in universities as well. And like we, we have been talking about, to consult young patients directly when drafting these poli policies that are affecting us. So it is, it's really good to be able to talk today and to be listened to today, and we do really appreciate that. So it's, it is great to be here and to have that, have that opportunity. Dunya, any final word from you before I hand over to our MEPs? Well, not, I just want to underline the importance of all national associations because they are, what, they are the connection between us all and the, that is why we are here speaking with you from all different countries. So um, helping each other is, is the key. That is all I want to say. Well, thank you very much. In that case, I will hand the floor over to, uh, to give us some, some final wrapping up thoughts to uh, MEP Ladislav Ilicic, who is obviously a member of the EP Interest Group. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Baker. Um, as a newest uh, member of this interest group of European Parliament for asthma and uh, allergies, um, I'm not that deep in this topic as all, all of other speakers are. But I have to say that it was a pleasure to listen to all of you and all sta stakeholders. Uh, I happen to know from first hand how it is to, to, to deal with uh, this problem since uh, I also have problems with allergy and, I, and some of my children have also. So I'm interested in, 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 this, in this, um, these topics. Faced with the allergies, I too found myself asking questions about the various treatments, prevalence, increase in allergic reactions during spring because of pollen season, what is my problem, which due to warmer temperatures is becoming longer every, every year. The unknown of how the disease affects you or when is concerning and uh, uh, has an impact on family and the society as a whole. As some of the most common chronic non-communicable diseases in Europe and globally, it is surprising that initiatives such as the NCD initiative launched earlier this year gives little attention to prevention and management of allergy and asthma. I come from Croatia, where according to studies, 5% of the population was reporting asthma in 2019. If it doesn't sound much, let me add that in uh, 2014, it was just 3%. So we have almost a double number of patients within five years, which shows a rapid increase in prevalence. At the same time, the overall prevalence of asthma and allergic diseases in children is also increasing, as it is in fact the case in most parts of the world. Therefore, it was inspiring to see the members of the youth parliament present here today, advocating and representing young patients in this discussion. I hope that their voices are heard and they will be more and more given a seat at the table when these decisions affecting them directly are being taken. There are many ways to bring change and it is important that discussion is happening. As a member of the European Parliament Interest Group on Allergy and Asthma, Having joined very recently, I am pleased to see that different stakeholders and groups are initiating conversation on this topic, which will hopefully lead to change. I think many current and future decisions on various fields at the EU level, and not only, can have an impact in improving the lives of people living with allergies and asthma by addressing some of the key elements that amount to a better and healthier environment for patients. For example, I am the ECR shadow reporter on the revision of the energy performance of billing directive, which is quite a huge file. And this is just one of the many examples where aspects such as the quality of indoor air can be addressed in order to make a change. Uh, uh, Mrs., uh, Mr. Olekas uh, from S&D uh, stressed the need to give um, a more more, more power to EU to solve this problem. I have a little bit of a different opinion uh, since I think that member states are closer to people, closer, closer to their patient. But I think that we have a lot in common that we share the need to cooperate more, to, to exchange um, uh, good practices 
and uh, this cooperation can lead really to better results for, for our patients. So we have a lot in common and we have a lot to do. And that's why I thank you all for your patience and for the possibility to, for, to uh, learn something from you and to exchange our practices. Thank you. And indeed, we will now hand over the floor to Mr. Olegas <laughs> to make his final remarks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I need to answer now the, uh, Mr. Uh, Ilchich, but uh, I, I fully agree that we should strengthen the national level, but also to open the possibility for European Union. For example, a reference center, the best experience from different countries. We, I think we need to have research and share for, for the country. Dear colleagues, uh, it is always refreshing to participate in events that hold such a promise for, for the future. So thank you all for, for your contributions uh, and especially the participants from the Allergy and Asthma Youth Parliament. It is great to see you here in, in, in Brussels. And following the, the discussion, my key takeaway is the EU Non-Communicable Disease Initiative is not the end, but only the start of the long journey of the EU to tackle the burden of non communicable diseases among with allergy and asthma uh, hold a prominent uh, position. And during this journey, we will need to work closely together, policymakers and stakeholders bringing together our very expertise. And answering the Professor Tari Hatela, I would like to say that our mission must to be protect the people from European citizens from the diseases, and to also ensure that patients receive the high quality care. In other words, our scope must be holistic, but always patient-centered. Because without a healthy population, uh, European Health Union will not be able to reach the, the goals. Thank you all again, and I wish a great afternoon and journey back to home. Well, thank you very much indeed for hosting us here in the European Parliament. I think we've heard some key messages today, and that's the importance of including asthma and allergy at all levels of decision making and policy making and closing those gaps. And of course, remembering the human angle that this isn't a trivial condition. This is something that has huge impacts. Those personal stories, I think, have really brought that home. Um, and we want to see a, a real expert space where people can exchange these best practices. And that's what we hope for going forward. Um, Obviously, this event has been recorded, as always, at the European Parliament and will be disseminated through the interest group channels. If you missed anything or any of those opening speeches, you can go back and listen to them again. Remember, please keep sharing online and social media. Keep your colleagues, your friends, your families involved in, in making sure this is still at the top of the agenda. And if you want to, please go and visit the our website, which is allergyasthmaparliament.org. All one word, allergyasthmaparliament.org. Those youth members here in the Parliament in Brussels, please go uh, to the cafeteria where you will have a chance to talk to those policymakers, those MEPs, and I hope that proves very fruitful for all of you. There will be an email going around tomorrow with evaluation of the event. If you could send your feedback on that, it would be really helpful. And finally, it only falls to me on behalf of the EFA to give sincere thanks to the EFA Sustainable Funding Partners, Sanofi and Regeneron, for their unrestricted educational grants, and they made this event happen possible. And of course, to everyone who tuned in, in the audience today. Thank you all very much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much, please. Oh, I thought you had to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.